Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Patrick Eddington. He's a policy analyst in Homeland Security and Civil Liberties at the Cato Institute. Welcome back to Free Thoughts. Thank you very much for having me. So from 1988 to 1996, you were a military imagery analyst at the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center. May it rest in peace. What does that all mean? So I was hired um, in the last big hiring wave uh, of the Cold War for folks they were looking at for doing satellite imagery work and overhead imagery work. And when we talk about this, we're talking about looking at not only satellite imagery but U2 photography and other forms of photography. And it's no different than the kind of uh, photographic analysis or imagery analysis that has been done mm, since World War I. Um, the technology has changed, obviously, a little bit, but the basics of it in so many ways remain the same. So that means so – well, first of all, were they still using U2s in the 80s? Mm. You, said, you said U2s. I was, we have yeah. been – we have continued to use the U2, I think, even up through the Iraq War. Oh, fascinating. So this is mostly uh, looking at – pictures. I mean, I, I'm obviously, you can't say everything, but, but probably not of America. So whenever they launch a new electro-optical imaging satellite, you know, which works in, in the visible spectrum, just like you and I are looking at each other right now, okay, they do calibration testing. Um, and some of that will be done over the United States. And they basically have a dispensation um, to do that. They'll also do calibration testing over other parts of the world as well. But they sometimes like, you know, being able to take photographs of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, you can just kind of fill in the blank. The Pentagon, you know, any large building essentially that's really well known um, or other large man-made features, you know, Hoover Dam, et cetera. So uh, to also to clarify, I assume you didn't have control over – you analyzed the photographs, but in terms of – who gets to say that the satellite is going to go take a picture of X, Y, and Z? Was that something that you could So, do? excellent question. Um, the way things were set up uh, in my day, you had this entity called COMEREX or the Committee on Imagery Exploitation and Requirements. And it was this big interagency group of muckety mucks essentially who kind of delegated down the authority for figuring out target sets. That's what we called them. Um, to basically, a, a, in government terms, a GS-15 level group of folks who would get together uh, and decide on you know, what you would basically be imaging. Now, some of these things were what were known as standing target decks. So this is stuff that would only be reviewed basically on a yearly basis. You knew, for example, that you're going to be taking photographs of Soviet air, airfields, Soviet shipyards, uh, all the rest of those kinds of things, right? So. Uh, for kind of emerging issues, um, you would then have folks, um, and this included individual analysts like me, who could actually put in for collection both of specific point targets, but also for things like uh, what we call directed search areas. So you would basically, if you're looking, I'll use the, the first Gulf War as an example. When we were trying to track Saddam Hussein's forces after they had invaded Kuwait in early August of 1990, one of the techniques that we needed to use uh, was this directed search area concept, which means essentially you're taking um, four geographic points that create uh, a rectangle uh, or a square or whatever, and you're basically asking the bird to go out and kind of shoot that whole area. Uh, and that's what you use basically to try to you know, find stuff that you think is out there or try to find stuff that you know has been in one particular location but you think has moved to another. And you'll, in the course of doing this, you'll utilize signals intelligence and if it's available, human intelligence or even open press sources to help you kind of refine exactly where you point the satellite. This sounds like it actually has interesting ramifications. The question of who gets to uh, direct the resources of the CIA has interesting ramifications for security now, particularly in terms yeah. of whose hard drive you're going to search or whose calls <laughs> you're going to tap or whatever, yeah. uh, and, and whether or not you're just going to go look at your ex-wife and what she's doing and who's yeah. staying at her house and things like that. Yeah. No, I mean, the the way that, I mean, Comorex um, and even individual analysts only had the authority to task foreign targets. So if, if I were to basically put in a nomination um, for a particular target, 
that had U.S. Geo coordinates. I can guarantee you that I would have got a phone call and somebody would have said, uh, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um, so in that respect, um, kind of the standing controls there, uh, I think generally worked pretty well. But and that's it, using a satellite, though. I mean, that's a big resource. It, it's, it, it, it is. Um, and that was kind of the fun thing about it, quite frankly, is because here I was, 25 years old, and they were basically giving me the ability to go in uh, and do this kind of stuff. And it was, it was remarkable, you know, I mean, to have that kind of authority um, to be able to point a multi-hundred million dollar satellite at a, at a point on the earth and tell it to take a picture of it. That's kind of cool. So how did you then as a 25-year-old end up doing this? What was your path into the CIA? Yeah, no, it was really very interesting. Um, I had always wanted to get into military intelligence. And when I went through my ROTC course at Southwest, what was then Southwest Missouri State University, now Missouri State University, um, you know, when you go through that process, they basically tell you, okay, list your top three, meaning um, the top three different branches within the Army that you wanted to go to. So I listed military intelligence first. I think I listed air defense artillery second and then armor third. Of course, the Army in its infinite wisdom, you know, it puts me uh, uh, in armor. Uh, and what was really hysterical about that is they put me through the very last course <laughs> Uh, at Fort Knox that was teaching uh, guys how to operate the M60A3 main battle tank, which was being replaced that very year by the new M1 Abrams. So they gave me the branch I didn't want, and they trained me on an obsolete tank. So it was they just- knew it was going to be obsolete. That, that sounds was, like a good government process it was, by itself. It was perfect. It was so perfect. So if I ever find one of those in the street or if like someone's selling one, I could be like, Pat, I need to operate this tank. I could fire it up for you. Okay, yeah. okay, I good. Could, I could actually do it. There's always going to be a last guy to die for a contracting change. <laughs> <laughs> good point. But what I will say is this. Um, going through that armor officer basic course, you know, it made me a combat arms officer. And it also helped me fundamentally when I became an actual intelligence officer at CIA because it helped me to understand instantly what I was looking at on imagery. Uh, and so that really gave me a leg up, frankly, on a lot of my competitors as I went through the training process. How did the CIA itself start? You know, America has, I mean, even since the revolution, we've had an intelligence element essentially within our government. Usually it's been a military intelligence element. Uh, but it wasn't until really the 20th century that you begin to kind of see the creation of essentially a standing intelligence capability for the United States. And that tended to be kind of siloed to begin with, right? So you had a, a nascent army intelligence capability, a nascent uh, naval intelligence capability, which really matured a lot during the First World War and in the interwar period. But it wasn't until uh, World War II itself that you began to see an interest essentially in something that would be more permanent uh, and kind of be broader in scope. And the guy who's really responsible for it uh, is a fellow by the name of William J. Wild Bill Donovan, uh, who was a World War I Army veteran, uh, won every major um, military accolade that you could think of, including the Medal of Honor. Uh, he became a businessman and an attorney and uh, in that interwar period, spent an awful lot of time traveling, um, circulating among European political and economic elites, uh, as well as uh, in Asia. And so he began to develop his own worldwide intelligence network. That's really what it boiled down to. So even though he was a Republican um, and wasn't crazy about Franklin Roosevelt, he and Roosevelt shared an absolute mortal fear about the rise of fascism uh, and what it would ultimately mean. And so uh, he began to develop, Roosevelt began to develop this relationship with Donovan in the late 1930s. And by the summer of 1941, he is basically asking Donovan to kind of stand up this thing that became known uh, as the uh, Committee on uh, Information, uh, or the, he asked him to become what would be known as the Coordinator of Information. And this would ultimately lead to the creation of this thing that we know as the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. And in modern military parlance, the OSS would really be more like the, the current United States Operation, uh, Special Operations Command or the Joint Special Operations Command. A lot of what the OSS did during World War II uh, wasn't just simply trying to collect information on the Germans and the Japanese and, and the uh, Italians. It was about actually parachuting people behind the lines to blow stuff up, right? So this is, this is kind of where the covert action 
uh, aspect uh, of the CIA would ultimately uh, emerge. And of course, like real they, guns of Navarro. Well, yeah, of yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly what it was. Uh, so, you know, you go through World War II and the OSS operates globally. Uh, it's probably more successful in the Balkans and in France and other places like that. But they develop a reputation. Uh, for some folks, it's a mixed reputation. Uh, but then Supreme Commander-in-Chief uh, Dwight Eisenhower thought highly of it. General Patton thought highly of it. So Donovan was able to develop a constituency essentially for this concept. And even after uh, Roosevelt's death uh, and his kind of loss of influence because he was definitely not on the same page uh, with Truman about a lot of this stuff, Donovan essentially kept up this lobbying campaign to create this kind of capability. And you know Truman's original concept for what we call the CIA today was essentially a think tank in a lot of respects. Uh, he wanted an entity that would actually gobble up all the available information overt, uh, overtly and covertly uh, and basically act as uh, an advisor to the president uh, in, that, in that respect. But with the rise of this very aggressive um, Soviet posture, in the wake uh, of World War II uh, and all these uh, de facto covert actions that the Soviets themselves were working, by 1947, Truman had really kind of come around to Donovan's way of thinking. And so this is how you get finally in the National Security Act of 1947, the formal creation of the CIA. And throughout pretty much all of its history, literally up until within the last decade or so, uh, it was almost always a four-component organization. First and foremost, what we became what became known as the Director of Operations, which is the the spy element. This is the James Bond type element, or you know, Jack Bauer element, whatever <laughs> uh, term you prefer. Um, the human spies, uh, the Director of Intelligence, which is actually uh, the think tank aspect of the CIA. Uh, the Director of Administration, which is pretty self explanatory. They provide the payroll and everything else, and then the Director of Science and Technology, which is where. Uh, I wound up working within the National Photographic Interpretation Center and that particular entity, NPIC as we called it, was really unique in, in so many ways. Um, most importantly, it was actually a joint organization. So while it was technically administratively controlled by the CIA, uh, it was a true joint entity in that we had Army, Navy, Air Force uh, and Marine Corps personnel, uh, uh, intelligence analysts integrated into our operation as well as folks from the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, this would become the organization that would give the CIA what I still think is its greatest accomplishment, uh, which is actually locating uh, the missiles in Cuba in 1962 and providing President Kennedy with the information he needed, essentially, in order to kind of navigate through that crisis. I've asked you this before, just personally, um, uh, but I think it, our listeners would enjoy the answer. What is the movie that best portrays, you think, the CIA and what it really does and is like? Yeah. Or, or book, I guess, but movie would probably be better. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when The Hunt for Red October came out in 1990, um, a bunch of us from NPIC uh, went to the premiere. Um, here in D.C. And we had this block of seats. And uh, since this movie is almost 30 years old, I'm going to assume this is not a spoiler for most people who are listening here. Uh, but there is a scene where Alec Baldwin's uh, character, Jack Ryan, the CIA analyst, uh, is basically going on about what he knows about Marco Ramius, the Soviet submarine commander and strategist and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the Army General President says, you know, how could you possibly know anything about this guy? You're just an analyst. And every one of us from NPIC just roared with laughter. And so you had this group of people in the theater who are just laughing uproariously and everybody else around us is basically beginning to look at us like, who the hell are these people? What are they doing? So we literally outed ourselves, right? I mean, if, if any Russian, uh, you know, KGB or GRU guy would be in the audience, he goes, oh, those are the CIA <laughs> uh, but in, in terms of kind of the basic process of assessing information, it, it's not a bad stand-in uh, in that respect uh, in a lot of ways. And, you know, the, the kind of uh, the bias and the attitude uh, that that general showed, there's some truth to that. I mean, there, there's always kind of been some truth to that. And within the agency itself, I think folks who worked in the director of intelligence has, have always kind of felt... Um, like they were the stepchild, right? 
because the agency's culture was built on Wild Bill Donovan's adventures and the adventures of the OSS in World War II and you know all the rest of this stuff. And that whole macho thing is very different than sitting at your desk or at a light table like I was just trying to figure out you know, what, the, what the other side was necessarily up to. And that continues to this day. Well, let me flip Trevor's question then. Um, so we know that your career looked just like a James Bond film, <laughs> but that's probably not typical. So when – what are the, – the CIA that we get from Hollywood movies and television, what are the things that people may – the myths that people may believe or what does Hollywood get most wrong about presenting it? Oh, I think there are probably a lot of things that, that Hollywood um, – gets wrong. I mean, this is an organization, you know, when you look at its history, uh, has a very, very mixed, I mean, really mixed track record, right? I mean, I cited what I felt was the high point uh, analytically for the agency, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there were a lot of low points and there have been many low points, right? So the, um, the idea that the agency is um, – uh, kind of always on the ball, always gets it right, et cetera, et cetera. I think for a long time in this country, a lot of folks were kind of mesmerized by that. Um, but I think you know we've we've seen some fundamental alterations in people's attitudes, and it isn't just you know in the post Watergate era, right, and the Church Committee era, and everything about what the agency had been up to kind of coming out. Um, it, it, it hasn't just been that. I mean, it's even more recent history. You know, we go back to the two thousand and two. Uh, Iraq National Intelligence Estimate, which is one of the greatest failures really uh, in the agency's history and mainly a moral failure, right? It wasn't so much – I mean it was an analytical failure. But it was an analytical failure that was driven by a refusal to stand up to George Bush and especially Dick Cheney and say, we're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We're going to tell you what we really think. Uh, and, and that was the real failure. And, and you had a cataclysmic failure of that kind. Uh, in 1967 uh, when you had a very similar circumstance whereby the, the Pentagon and its intelligence el uh, element uh, at General Westmoreland's behest – he was our commander in Vietnam at the time – was pushing this notion that we were winning the war in Vietnam. And one of my predecessors at CIA, a man who I revere and whose picture is on my desk uh, in this building, Sam Adams, figured out by 1967 that Westmoreland was lying that we were in fact facing at least twice as many Viet Cong uh, and North Vietnamese forces as he and his intelligence staff uh, were claiming. And Adams and some of his colleagues in the agency went head to head um, with those folks. But they were betrayed by CIA Director Richard Helms who decided to go along with these falsified estimates. Uh, and then when the Tet Offensive happens in 1968, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, Westmoreland blew it. He lied, et cetera, et cetera. This came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and so, you know, um, that literally precipitated not only Lyndon Johnson's political fall because he would basically tied his fate to Westmoreland and the, and the entire campaign in Vietnam. Uh, but it really began, I think, um, the destruction of the agency's reputation in a lot of respects. So you go from this high, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 – where you could make an argument that the CIA really did help to save the world, right? To six years later, the agency essentially going along with a fraudulent intelligence estimate that helps to prolong the war in Vietnam by years and basically leads to tens of thousands more American uh, deaths and hundreds of thousands more wounded. So there's definitely a, a overcompetence. That, that's sort of what I – with Aaron's question about what do they get wrong. Yeah. And I, it's part of this I think too that the, the – particularly conservatives, I think they generally think the military is more competent than it actually is. Yeah. Um, and then we just do have this idea of born movies that the intelligence communities know everything oh, yeah. and that they're ever – and yeah. all these James Bond kind of people. Yeah. And we also of course had the FBI and the NSA and, and maybe yeah. some dark agency behind everything. Right. I mean, you know, these kind of popular perceptions. The actually, gnomes what, what of the, Zurich. What was that? <laughs> the gnomes of Zurich. The gnomes of Zurich. <laughs> but actually – what is the difference between the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA for, th for those who don't know? So the, the interesting thing about these agencies um, is how much they compete with each other. Um, but in terms of kind of the history and the origins and all the rest of that, uh, the FBI is the oldest uh, created uh, as a result of another domestic spying controversy, you know, one of the very first ones in our country. 
Um, for the longest time, the Secret Service itself was the element that was most responsible for actually conducting forms of domestic surveillance uh, here in the country. And at the beginning of the 20th century, of course, particularly in the wake of the assassination of President McKinley, the focus was on anarchist, right? Um, the anarchism and not the kind that we talk about on free thoughts, right? <laughs> well, the, the ones who are left wing bomb throwing. Well, sure. I mean, you you had, as you know, you know, a couple of different strains of anarchism that developed in Europe in the in the mid nineteenth century. Um, but there was ultimately a violent strain of this, you know, that develops, and it starts in Europe, and you have this series of uh, bombings and assassinations, particularly against uh, European heads of state, European royalty. Uh, and King Umberto I of Italy was the one who was killed literally just a little bit over a year before the assassination attempt against uh, President McKinley. So the uh, Secret Service literally began to keep track of every single anarchist here domestically or abroad. Um, and they actually kept their names and where they could get them, their addresses in these written ledger books um, at, uh, at Secret Service headquarters in the Department of Treasury. And it, it's really interesting because – uh, in, in researching all of this, I discovered that I was probably the first researcher in the United States to actually look at those particular records uh, at the National Archives. And it was, it was chilling to see other human beings' names essentially written down in these books and knowing precisely why they were doing it. And you didn't actually have to have committed an act uh, uh, of violence, right, to get your name recorded here. You just had to be an alleged or actual anarchist, a professed anarchist, if you will. So um, when President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, takes over after the uh, assassination of McKinley, um, he begins to very aggressively use the Secret Service for a variety of things. Uh, a lot of different federal departments uh, begged essentially to have Secret Service agents to help them uh, expose crimes that were under the purview essentially of these departments. So you get – you know, white slave traffic, if you will, the illegal importation of Chinese workers, it gets investigated. Um, land fraud cases within the Department of Interior become a huge, huge area of business for the Secret Service. But then uh, some folks within the executive branch, you know, take it even further than that. Um, and in 1907, the Secretary of the Navy asked the Secret Service to basically spy on a midshipman who is believed to be having an affair uh, with the daughter of a very politically connected couple um, here in Washington. And this leaks. This gets out. And this is what gets into the press. And this is what then begins to motivate Congress to actually try to do something to rein this in. And so they pass legislation in 1908 that restricts the Secret Service to just protecting the president and to just going after counterfeiters. Roosevelt's response through his attorney general, Charles Bonaparte, who was in fact a relative of Napoleon, um, is to create what became known as the Bureau of Investigation. So they created the, the what would become known as the FBI in 1935. They created this out of whole cloth using generally appropriated funds with absolutely no congressional authorization. So they get this thing off the ground and Roosevelt's last year in office is just super contentious with Congress over this issue especially. Once he's gone and Taft takes over, you suddenly see Congress lose interest in really what the Bureau is up to and all the rest of that. And so it's in this period of the Taft and Wilson administrations that you see kind of an exponential growth in the Bureau uh, and it's beginning to kind of get into some of these other domestic surveillance activities that would then give us the, the J. Edgar Hoovers and everything else that would kind of follow after that. So that's kind of the FBI's origin um, and then, of course, the National Security Agency is an outgrowth of these different Army and Navy intelligence programs that, that began in basically in the pre-World War I era uh, and then became very large organizations during World War II itself. And the Pearl Harbor Committee, one of the recommendations that they made uh, was that these cryptographic efforts, these code-breaking efforts by the Army and Navy be combined into a single entity. And so this is how we get the National Security Agency. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, my former employer, uh, is also essentially kind of stood up uh, in, in the same time period as we discussed earlier. As far as their reach, are there differences? So we – that surveillance, mass surveillance is the big thing mm -hmm. right now. Are there differences between the three agencies? Because all three of them come up in the context of surveillance of 
who they surveil and how they go about it? The FBI and NSA probably um, are the two that have the greatest overlap in many respects at this point. Um, and part of this goes back to uh, the change in Rule 41 uh, that went into effect last year that now basically gives the Bureau the ability to go to any magistrate judge pretty much anywhere in this country and say, we want to get into these computers that are located in X, Y, and Z place that don't even have to be in the same jurisdiction as this judge is now. Uh, and they can go up and they can get this data. So the FBI in its own way is kind of getting into the mass surveillance business and has been in the mass surveillance business. But NSA's reach is global. Uh, and because of the partnerships that they have with the major telecommunications organizations uh, that we know so much more about now thanks to the heroism of Edward Snowden, um, it, it dwarfs what the FBI you know, can kind of do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's an awful lot of coordination and this is something else that the WikiLeaks um, uh, dumps on this so-called Vault 7 uh, and the CIA and its hacking tools kind of helped us to understand in even more depth. A lot of these hacking tools that have been discussed are actually shared not just amongst FBI, CIA, and NSA, but also with our British cousins uh, at the General Code uh, and Cipher School and Headquarters, or GCHQ as it's known. So when we kind of look at the scope of it, NSA very heavily focused on foreign intelligence, um, mass collection of data there. CIA also um, focused heavily on the collection of foreign intelligence, but usually in a much more targeted fashion. And if you kind of look at these so-called Vault 7 leaks, uh, that's what you see. Most of the exploits that we're talking about here tend to be designed to go against individual machines, whereas NSA seeks to actually get to the backbone and does get to the backbone of the internet, which gives them the ability to just you know, sweep up literally hundreds of millions of communications almost on a daily basis. Does the uh, NSA, I assume, I think that the CIA is the one that actually has spies, like human assets, or does the NSA use human, like, spies in so, some ways? So you have um, a little bit of a division here. On the one hand, you have CIA, which runs essentially this agent network on a global basis. Um, the agency- Would you say that they're in every country in America or in the, in the world, <laughs> probably? They, they are in every country that is ultimately of concern to the United States, right? Um, you're going to put more case officers and more assets uh, against you know, the, the targets that really matter to you. But there are also some targets that are extremely difficult to operate against. And I would put North Korea and Iran at the top of those lists, especially North Korea. Um, the ability to actually physically get people in there, the ability to actually recruit people, I think, is a, uh, a very daunting prospect, um, which is why I think a lot of people at CIA are probably extremely pro-Iran nuclear agreement. They would like to see a lot more of these kinds of things. They would like to see American businesses be able to get in there because it would give them more pathways to actually gather intelligence. Um, the Defense Intelligence Agency also runs its own set uh, of assets and sources. Most of its activity is supposed to be against foreign military targets. You have what are known as the defense attaches who are, of course, assigned to every embassy uh, that we have around the world, but DHS or the the Defense Human Service um, operates its own assets as well, and so you get into these issues, oftentimes where um, maybe the agency is trying to run an operation against somebody, and DIA is trying to run an operation against somebody, and if the coordination is not there, some very very bad things can happen. So just to they're both spies and they're both running operations against each other and they're not talking to each other. Yeah. That sounds like either a tragic comedy or a hilarious, uh, you know, Pinkerton <laughs> detectives kind of story. Spy versus spy. Spy versus spy. Um, so let's talk about those WikiLeaks. Uh, the, what, what generally happened and I guess will happen. They're not all out yet. And what did you – did you learn anything? What did we learn and did you learn anything that shocked you? I wouldn't say that I learned anything that necessarily shocked me. Um, I think it was more a question of having a lot of existing suspicions confirmed more than anything else. Um, at the beginning of March of 2017, uh, we had this initial dump of uh, not quite 9,000 documents uh, by WikiLeaks, probably as a result of a disgruntled 
uh, CIA contractor or ex-CIA contractor uh, providing essentially information on these tools and in some case actual source code uh, for some of these tools uh, to WikiLeaks. What we did learn that I thought was significant is that whereas the agency for most of its existence had these four directorates that I mentioned earlier, you now have a fifth, this uh, uh, Directorate of Digital Innovation uh, or DDI as it's known. And it's underneath this fifth directorate where all of this uh, clandestine hacking activity uh, basically takes place. The fact that the agency has established an entire directorate dedicated to just this, for me, is the big news. Um, that, that means that they had to get approval from Congress to do that. They also obviously had to get a lot of money and additional resources from Congress. And as I've noted in some of the stuff that I've published on this, the, the silence from Congress on this in terms of the implications of it has been kind of deafening. Everything that's been revealed so far is about CIA hacking efforts against commercially available software, firmware, and hardware. In other words, the stuff that you and I and everybody else uses in their homes and in their businesses. And that to me is like the real problem. And I, I've used this analogy before. I look at this kind of malware. I look at these kinds of tools basically as like the one ring from the Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, you think that you know what, it's like a super weapon essentially and we know it's evil and we know it can do a lot of damage and we're really, really not going to use it unless it's like the most extreme circumstance and we don't have a choice and then we'll employ it. The and then once you do have it, you're like, ah, I might put it on my <laughs> That's exactly it, right? And so the other part of it is everybody else wants this too. So when you turn around, you create these tools and then you apparently put them on a single server or a single um, local area network as the agency apparently did. It's an invitation to hackers. You know, it's like come and get it, right? To hack the CIA. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of folks uh, in the privacy and civil liberties and technology community have been warning for years about this very kind of scenario. And now it's come to pass. So the, the exploits that came out in the first batch and then – was it yesterday that there was a second yes. batch? And the second yes. batch seemed to be a lot about Apple products. Um, but Apple announced today or yesterday that these were all old exploits that had been patched long ago. Should we take that as this was dangerous stuff and they may have done things with it but we don't have to worry or is it likely that they have found – even more exploits on top of the ones that we've seen the old versions of. So we should bear in mind that whatever this individual or individuals gave to WikiLeaks is simply what the individuals chose to give to WikiLeaks. It does not necessarily, contrary to Julian Assange's propaganda, it does not necessarily represent everything that the CIA has. We also know that um, – the material that's, that's been contained in these two dumps so far covers essentially the period from 2013 to roughly 2016. But I don't think it's necessarily inclusive and I, I think it would be a mistake to necessarily assume that it's all inclusive. You know, I'm an Apple product user. I have been since 2007. My entire household is nothing but Apple stuff. Um, but if Apple has a weakness, it is the fact that they do not release their source code for public audit. Right? And so, you know, kind of within the cryptography community, that's the gold standard. Um, open source stuff is the gold standard because it means that you have to subject your stuff to peer review from other cryptographers, which is how you really get a chance to test whether or not this stuff, you know, is worth anything. That's why Open Whisper Systems uh, Signal messaging app is considered still to this day the gold standard uh, for that kind of activity because there is no evidence thus far that anybody has been able to crack it, including the National Security Agency. You can't necessarily say that about Apple um, because, you know, their source code is proprietary. You know, they don't, they don't put it out there. That's not to say that as a general rule, uh, they're not doing, I think, what most people would, would characterize as a pretty damn good job, you know, trying to do this. But as our friend Oren Kerr at, at George Washington uh, University Law School has observed, um, we don't know how to write perfect software, right? So even the best efforts of folks, whether they're working with proprietary stuff like Apple or whether they're doing it with open source stuff, 
uh, just you're going to find gaps. And that's why it's an arms race. That's why you always have to kind of keep up with it. And uh, that's exactly how the intelligence community looks at it. We've had very strong commercial encryption, commercially available and open source and free encryption for quite a while. I mean, I generated PGP keys back when I was in middle school and high school. Um, so why – given that and given that these – there's ones out there that to our knowledge have not been cracked yet and are fairly easy to use, why is this a problem? Like why do they have access to so much stuff still if we can encrypt it powerfully and easily? So in, in the case of some of these exploits having to do with iOS, App, Apple's mobile operating system, um, the agency apparently at least had one that gave them the ability to get right at the base operating system itself. So when you're able to do that, you can install software that allows you to log every keystroke. And if you can do that, the game is over because then you get every password. Anything anybody types on that, they're going to be able to figure out. So even though in this case, Signal and even WhatsApp from what I understand – um, remain essentially fine when you're able to circumvent the encryption literally by just getting directly at the keyboard. You know that's an issue, uh, and so you know the war goes on, and and it's going to be that way uh, until the day comes when we can actually develop flawless software. And I kind of doubt that's like over the immediate horizon. Do you think though that we will end up sometime in the relatively near future where at, at the very least – so yes, if they get access to your device itself, they can get at your information. Mm -hmm. But where all internet traffic itself um, and all communications traffic is encrypted end to end. So there are lots of different places along the way um, that it can be intercepted, right? So if you're able to get on the internet backbone, for example, um, if you're able to get into other places before the actual encryption take, takes place, then you're able to defeat it. And, and because there are so many parts to the system of, of communications, digital communications, it means that there are potentially a number of different attack vectors, right? A number, a number of different weak points. Um, one of my favorite things about Glenn Greenwald's book, No Place to Hide, which is about the whole Snowden episode, is the photograph that he put in there of folks from NSA's Tailored Access Operations or TAO office breaking open uh, Cisco router boxes in order to actually put implants in them, right? So when you have the ability to potentially get into a supply chain uh, and, and put implants like that in, it just gets back to this whole issue, the larger issue of reining in the intelligence community and federal law enforcement in terms of what they're engaged in because they're, they're treating the entire internet and the entire global telecommunications infrastructure as an absolutely no holds barred target. Whereas in the pre-internet age, all of this intelligence collection activity was going against other countries' ciphers and codes because they were passing over dedicated communication circuits, dedicated communications cables. And while that's still largely the case for a lot of your most sensitive military and diplomatic traffic, it's not exclusively the case. And when we talk about the terrorism threat, which is really where a lot of this collection is justified or they, they – let me rephrase that. It's how they justify the collection against the internet and, and the digital infrastructure of the, of the globe. They're really attacking all of us at the end of the day. And that's what makes it you know, so incredibly disturbing. It's just this mentality of – my highest duty, and if you listen carefully, it doesn't matter whether it's a president or an attorney general or a DNI, it's always some formulation of my highest duty is to protect the American people, which is, as libertarians, as we know, is a lie. Their highest duty is to protect the Bill of Rights and to uphold our rights and to uphold the Constitution. But that's part of the problem that we have today. It's the age that we're living in where everyone and especially folks in government and a lot of our friends in the media – have gotten into this habit of repeating this nonsense that you can have a completely safe and secure world and, and still be free. The founders understood that the only way that you can be safe and secure is if you have liberty, if the government can't do these very things. But that's what's been lost. And for me, that's the, the greatest challenge I face on a daily basis really is trying to explain to folks, especially on Capitol Hill, 
do you understand the mistake that you're making here? You know, by buying into this this uh, government argument, and that's really what they're doing. Okay, but so government, you know, one of its key roles, the reason that you know, if we take our uh, social contract, you know, we're getting out of the state of nature. The the reason we institute it in the first place is to protect us. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have set it up. And so, for a lot of people, you know, so like say me, I for those law enforcement agents listening in, am not engaged in any criminal activity, nor am I planning a terrorist attack. So why should I really be bothered? Like if it right. even if it keeps me it doesn't it doesn't keep me perfectly safe, but maybe it keeps me a little bit safer than I would have otherwise been. So why should I be bothered by them listening in on Trevor and me arguing about Batman versus Daredevil? <laughs> <laughs> Daredevil, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the the fundamental problem is essentially the, the the precept that they operate under, which is this idea that they need to collect it all. To use a, a Keith Alexander phrase, a former or, NSA or a Pokemon phrase, I guess yes. that would be too. Yes, yes. Um, and if you're collecting everything, it means you don't actually know who the hell it is that you're really supposed to be going after, right? I mean, if we go back to the entire precept of the Fourth Amendment. It's about individualized, particularized suspicion based on a probable cause standard. In other words, you're supposed to be going after individual human beings. And, and that's what we have here. We have a small group of, of human beings out there, I'm thinking specifically Salafist terrorist organizations, um, who represent a certain level of threat, right? But in comparison to other threats, they kind of shrink to insignificance. So, for example, if you look at the number of, of people that are actually killed in terrorist incidents in this country on a yearly basis, I'm talking post 9-11 now, which is definitely a one-off event that was caused by incompetence among FBI, CIA, and NSA not actually sharing the information they already had. In a post 9-11 environment, in a year-in and year-out basis, you're much more likely to be shot and killed by a cop in this country you know, than you are a terrorist. So, to me, Sure, having government is designed to do certain limited things, but when f when folks in government begin to view each and every one of us as a potential suspect first and citizen second, which is exactly how our system works right now, that's exactly how you get these abuses and it's also why they actually don't get the bad guys. I wanted to clarify something you brought up if uh, our listeners are not familiar with this. the. The Cisco routers, because you mentioned it briefly, um, that uh, uh, one of – it was in Snowden's leaks, correct? That, mm -hmm. that they – for routers being shipped to the retail market mm -hmm. in Europe, mm -hmm. the U.S. government intercepted the boxes, opened them up and placed – and so it had physical access mm -hmm. to the routers mm -hmm. and placed s something in them so they could constantly mm – -hmm. so they undermined – the company Cisco, mm -hmm. they undermined. Uh, I mean, and so it shows that even if you lock down the information streams, that you're just doing an old fashioned, I think you call it a black bag, is what you call yeah, it? Yes, so a black bag job is what we call it. Just, just go and, and, you know, put something on their t smart television so they can use it. Because I think one of the one of the leaks was about that your smart TV might be watching you. Yeah. But I think they had needed physical access to they the did. smart TV to get that. But then they, they just say, hey, you know, we're here to do a building inspection, um, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm with Comcast. I'm, I'm I understand you. Exactly. <laughs> or if uh, they, they know that you live in an area – you intercept shipments to that area. Yeah. So you don't even need, and that they will do that if they're if they're blocked from one area. Don't you know? Don't think. Well, I guess we can't get to that. They yeah. will, they will absolutely go well, go to the you know nitty gritty level to absolutely. try and access. I, I mean, look under the Patriot Act, right? When you talk about Section two hundred and fifteen of the Patriot Act, it's all tangible things. It's that business records provision. So they could under the Patriot Act basically go to Best Buy or whoever and say. Um, has so-and-so ordered this router? Uh, yeah, they have. Okay, great. Number one, you can't talk about this. <laughs> this is a gag order. Uh, number two, uh, where's the box? And boom. That's it. That's it, right? And, you know, I mean, look, if they're going after somebody who's like a child pornographer or something like that and they got genuine probable cause, that's one thing. But to do what they have been doing, which is literally engaging in this kind of fishing expedition um, surveillance uh, on just an absolutely massive scale, um, there is nothing that's remotely Fourth Amendment compliant about that. And it's also militarily and, and from an intelligence standpoint, completely ineffective. 
Like you didn't you didn't take pictures. You would use when you did photographic analysis. You had them take a picture of an area. If they would have given you a picture of the whole country in minute detail, it would not have made your job easier to it, find what you were looking it for. It would have made my job infinitely more difficult. And and that's the thing about it. You know, you have to be able to zero in on who the bad guys are. And listen, this gets back to the fundamental problem with my former employer. For decades, they have operated out of embassies and consulates, right? I mean, this is not a secret. If you go to the CIA website and you read about the account of the of the takeover of the embassy in Iran, uh, in Tehran, there's an account there of how they were operating out of the embassy. It's not a secret, you know, in that respect to talk about it. Everybody basically understands that they do that. That's the drawback, right? I mean, if you're not able to essentially recruit enough folks in a given society and have them essentially be what are known as NOCs, you know, non-official cover type agents, um, and have them be assets. And these are like native-born folks who, who can literally like move around in the society without drawing any kind of real suspicion or anything like that. If you can't get to that point in a given country with human intelligence collection, you have a problem. And this continues to be, I think, a huge problem for the United States throughout the entire Arab and Muslim world. Um, and and there's, you know, there's no easy solution to it, right? I mean because we have spent so much time doing so many bad things and backing so many lousy governments over there that nobody trusts us. I mean that's one of the reasons why anti-Americanism is so great. Well, when anti-Americanism is so profound, when it's so deep-seated, how in the world are you going to be able to actually approach people successfully to get them to work for the Central Intelligence Agency as, as an asset you know, for a lengthy period of time? Very tough. So I have a clarifying question about Kind of a detail that you mentioned, and I'm curious about. Um, so you you mentioned when you thought the the WikiLeaks dumps were from a disgruntled contractor, mm -hmm. um, and Snowden was a contractor. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why we see these leaks coming from contractors as opposed to agents, or or are they the same thing? It's an interesting question um, that has been posed. I tend to think that it's more a matter of coincidence at this point than anything else. Because if you go back and look at a lot of the uh, leaks or espionage cases over the course of the last 30 years, the vast majority of them actually involve government employees. Um, it has been interesting to see, you know, kind of back to back here, uh, Snowden and then what, what's be basically being billed by most folks in government right now who are at least being quoted. Uh, on this, whether it's on the record or on background, uh, as more than likely being a result of, of, of some contractors who basically like shared these tools uh, among themselves in a, an unauthorized fashion. Uh, and then that's how you wind up, you know, having all this go down. I do find it interesting, though, that it still happens post Snowden because they initiated all these so-called insider threat programs to try to prevent this very thing from happening. And it still happened. So we have seen thousands and thousands of leaked documents about the surveillance program and lots and lots of details of how it works, lots of details about how the CIA breaks into devices. Among those countless documents, have any of them shown evidence of this working? Like have there been any leaks of reports that yes, the surveillance program stopped this or got this guy that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten? To date. And, and again, bearing in mind that we only know essentially what has leaked out or what has otherwise been publicly acknowledged. The only post 9-11 program that I think we can even moderately say has had some kind of an impact is the FISA Amendments Act Section 702 program. Um, that particular program, just to refresh folks, um, when the original illegal warrantless surveillance program was exposed by the New York Times, uh, Jim's, Jim Risen in December 2005, um, that particular program was known as Stellar Wind. And uh, that was the original mass surveillance program that was started literally just two days after the 9-11 attacks. Michael Hayden, then NSA director, is the one who authorized it. We know on the basis uh, of both the Snowden leaks and then follow-up reporting and Freedom of Information Act request lawsuit work by the New York Times' Charlie Savage that the inspectors general of the intelligence community actually did an audit essentially of this program. And when they actually asked the analysts, people like me, 
was this actually of any value to you? The answer was no. Um, now, the, the muckety mucks up the chain, right? The political appointees and all the rest of them. Absolutely vital tool, yada, yada, yada. But the actual worker bees who are the ones who really do the work to try to find the bad guys said, mm, not really. In the case of Section 702, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, before it effectively went defunct towards the end of the Obama administration, um, they did a report on Section 702 back in 2014, I believe. And they actually said that there was pretty credible evidence that this program had in fact been responsible for helping identify previously unknown terrorist networks, et cetera, et cetera. Now, none of the rest of us have actually seen the evidence, but that was a bipartisan panel, um, three Republicans, two Democrats, and they were pretty much unanimous you know, in their assessment of it. So that's the most um, publicly known and objective uh, assessment essentially that we have, but it's the only one. You know, the other program that, that Snowden exposed, the Section 215 Telephone Metadata Mass Surveillance Program, totally ineffective. Never caught anybody, never saved a single life, et cetera. Um, and I don't think anybody was really terribly surprised by that. The Section 702 program was instituted in uh, 2008 essentially to try to take that illegal stellar wind warrantless surveillance program and turn it into something legal and at least nominally constitutionally compliant, although I think most of us of our persuasion uh, would still argue that that is not the case. Uh, but in any event, what this program does is it allows the NSA to basically collect whatever they want to in the way of foreign intelligence over the communications networks of the world. And because of the nature of the communications network, you are inevitably going to sweep up U.S. person communications, right? This is called, quote, incidental collection, end quote. And I, I use air quotes for that because I think it's a, um, a little bit of a misnomer. But in any event, this is probably how uh, General Michael Flynn's communications with Russian officials were actually captured. So it wasn't that Obama ordered Flynn and Trump and the rest of them uh, to be subjected to direct wiretapping. It is that the normal operation of the 702 program in collecting these kinds of U.S. to overseas communications picked up Flynn, probably picked up others, and on the basis of the actual foreign targets of the 702 collection, in this case the Russian ambassador and probably some others, a decision was then made after it had been bumped way up the chain of command uh, to go ahead and initiate other forms of collection. My guess is Flynn was probably subjected uh, to full-blown uh, FISA surveillance uh, in the wake of this thing. There may well have been others who were subjected uh, to more fulsome FISA surveillance uh, after this. But the 702 program is the only um, quasi-mass surveillance program that we can actually point to, or at least that some folks have pointed to, to say this has actually been useful in the fight against Salafist terrorists. On the Michael Flynn point, there has been a lot of discussion uh, in the opening months of the Trump administration about the relationship between the intelligence community and Trump and yeah. possible leaks and, and what they may know. Bro just broadly asking, because it's hard to ask a specific question about this, but as someone who, who has been a member of that community and who knows how it works and probably knows people still there, uh, what's your read on what's going on? Are they... Are they worried and trying to leak or some of them are? Is there an internal battle? Is it, is it a mixture of all three? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of things that are probably in play here. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that some former Obama administration officials have been really pushing this whole Trump uh, – I mean as far as I'm concerned, the line they've been pushing is Trump is a de facto controlled agent of Vladimir Putin. Right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean he, that's, that's the Manchurian candidate. Yeah, but, but. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and to be clear, there is zero evidence that has surfaced so far to validate that, zero. I don't believe that Donald Trump is a controlled agent of the Russian Federation. For one thing, I don't think they'd be too – they'd be that stupid to try to recruit a guy <laughs> who is clearly so completely uncontrollable uh, that he would be you know, vastly more trouble than he's worth. That's not to say that some folks that have surrounded Mr. Trump or been in his orbit uh, may not have actually been targets uh, of, of the Russian intelligence services. Mr. Manafort may well have been. Uh, General Flynn may have been. That's why we need a comprehensive investigation, which is something that I've kind of been on a hobby horse about since at least December uh, of 2016. But I think 
there are definitely some folks uh, in the intelligence community who um, are not Trump fans, um, and, and that's easy to see why. I mean, you know, he's he's denigrated their product. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when he said, you know, these are the same people that blew it with Iraq, that was a factually accurate statement. And and the 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 point that I've made to people is, look, if folks in the intelligence community can't take some honest criticism that's based on fact, then they have no chance of protecting us from the likes of Al Qaeda or ISIS or anybody else. Um, if you're going to get into this business, uh, you need to have a relatively thick skin, and you need to understand that the political uh, headwinds are going to surround you all the time. You just have to learn to adjust to that, and you have to, if you're going to be a really good intelligence officer, you have to be willing to say no. You have to be willing, to, in fact, you have to be willing to walk away from your career if necessary in order to maintain your integrity. And the, the problem we've had over and over again in the course of the last several decades is folks have not been willing to walk away, right? They've been willing to go along to get along. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this whole thing plays out. It's obviously gotten much more political in the last few days with the, all the back and forth between Mr. Nunez and Mr. Schiff and, and some of Mr. Nunez's very questionable actions. But uh, How uh, paranoid are you and how paranoid should we be? I, I, I just do. You, do you put tape over the camera on your computer? Well, I have software. Okay, all right. So yeah, no, I, I, I have software. Um, look, I worry a, a lot more on a day to day basis about the NSA and the FBI than I do my former employer. Um, even though I know they monitor what I write and what I publish. Um, in the fall of 2015 or in summer of 2015, I got a nice. So wait, will CIA agent listen to this? Do you think? Oh, sure they will. Can we will. say hi to them right now? Oh, I, okay. I, I, hey, I hey, how's it going? Uh, <laughs> Tell your friends to listen. Yeah, I can guarantee you they will. And leave a review on iTunes. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, you know, some of the stuff that I've written for Cato, I've gotten uh, nasty letters uh, from CIA security on. And um, uh, stuff I've had published in, in CNN and elsewhere, usually in connection with the torture investigation, right? Um, because they, uh, they're not fans of having, you know, people be reminded of all of that. Uh, and I send them back, you know, little notes. Um, I, I normally don't use profanity or vulgarity or, you know, anything like that. But I, I will basically remind them that I retain counsel and, and, you know, all the rest of those kinds of things. But I think, you know, each one of us should be concerned about just the proliferation of all of this surveillance. And it's not just at the national level, right? Our colleague Adam Bates has a terrific paper out about this Stingray technology, these, these cell site simulators uh, that are basically loaned out by the FBI and other federal law enforcement to state and locals. Uh, and they've used those to surveil protesters in Baltimore and, and all over the country. So it's the pervasiveness of this stuff and kind of the interlocking nature of it. It's kind of a perverse form of federalism, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a, a surveillance form of federalism that we should all be opposed to. Uh, because it's a direct threat to our liberty. Um, as I like to tell people, it doesn't matter whether you think you don't have anything to hide. It only matters what the government charges you with. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.